So today we are talking about this whole idea that God owns us. And again, that sounds kind of strange, and especially in today's culture. It sounds like oppression. It sounds like slavery. It sounds like something not good. But as we dig into God's Word, you're going to see it's something wonderful and magnificent. So I want to start out by just kind of tracing a little bit of my background so you understand my struggle is similar to your struggle. <clears throat> when I was a young guy, probably 13, 14 I was confirmed in the Lutheran Church, like many of you were, and um, I kind of had the basics, at least up here, not here, but up here, and um, going through the teenage years, I remember the day my mom said, you're old enough to decide for yourself if you want to go to church, and I said, I'm staying home, (laughs) and that's why my mom says she prayed more for me than all the rest, and I have five brothers and two sisters. Well, when she came home from church, she was very sad, and I couldn't do that to my mom, so I started going to church again after one week off. (laughs) But, you know, I was a young guy, foolish like a lot of people at that point, kind of immature, and, and I was just, had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, and I was talking to lots of different people because you're coming to the end of your high school time, and you're supposed to have an answer when they say, what are you going to be when you grow up, or when you go out, or what are you going to study, and all those kinds of questions, and all of a sudden you feel like, wow, I got the power to determine my destiny, you know, I can, I can just lay out the path, and that's where I'm going. Well, we ask those questions, but a lot of times we don't ask him to be involved, right? It's based on what we feel, what we're interested in, or maybe what a friend's doing, or somebody else, or how much money you make, or that kind of stuff. Well, my direction was influenced by my sister-in-law, who's a wonderful lady, still a fantastic, godly woman, and, but at that point, she was just graduated from college with a degree in anthropology, and so she's telling me all about what she had studied, and I was fascinated with it and really soaking it up, and she talked about different careers that were possible in that area, one of them being a zooarchaeologist, and of course, you know exactly what that is, right? Nobody knows what that is. A zooarchaeologist is the guy at the dig site that identifies the bones and tells you about the animals they came from, things like that. Well, when I started college, I had two majors and two minors, and I really had no direction. I was just trying to chase this vague concept of being what my sister-in-law had described. And I hadn't included God at all in the conversation. I hadn't talked to God. I hadn't asked him what he thought I should do. I hadn't seeked his guidance or wisdom. I simply was going on an idea that somebody else suggested. I really had no direction. But God is a God who's very loving and personal and wants to be involved in guiding you and helping you in your life as you pursue your path and the path that he lays out for you. So I need to help you by laying a foundation today that is really bedrock for us as Christians. We're going to start out with this idea that God is the creator of every living thing. This is so important for us to believe as Christians, that God is creator of every living thing. It's the bedrock of our faith that He's the creator. So we start out in Genesis chapter 1. If you want to look there, you can look there. We're going to have several readings from Genesis, but then we're going to move to other parts of the Scriptures. But starting out with this idea God is the creator of every living thing. I'm going to read from Genesis 1, verses 20 to 25, and I just want these words to wash over you and just soak them in as you hear them and think of, this is God Almighty. This is God Almighty. So it says, And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly over the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts according to, uh, of the earth according to their kinds 
And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, I don't know about you, but I mean, you can, you can say something's good or you can say something's bad, but when God says something's good, it's absolutely flawless. It's perfect. It's wonderful. It's magnificent. It's every superlative that you could imagine. When God says something's good, it's Amazing. So he created all living creatures, every living creature. And one of the things I like to do just for fun to relax on my day off, I call it creation therapy. You know, if it's in the season, I'll sit in a tree and watch the day begin and see the birds fly and hear the animals call and all the different things, just marveling at God's design of everything. And we have a hanging plant in our backyard that attracts hummingbirds. And they're so magnificent. These tiny little birds come and they're getting all the nectar out of the flowers, all the blooms, and it's just beautiful to watch. And just thinking, God made that. God made that. He made those beautiful little creatures. God is the creator of every living thing. The second thing I want to talk about is that God isn't just the creator of what's out there, but he's the creator of you too. He created you in the beautiful and wonderful way. So we'll start out with the passage from Genesis 1, 26 to 27, which is immediately following what we just read, and it describes how God made us. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So this is in the beginning. This is how he designed it. He created us in his image. And obviously, we all look exactly alike, right? (laughs) It's obvious that when we read that, image doesn't mean what we would use it to mean. Image is something more wonderful, more, more amazing. When God created us in His image, He created us with the capacity to have a relationship with Him. That was the whole idea behind the image and the design. God wanted to love His creation and receive love in return. That was behind His design. It's His primary will is to love all of us. And so when He created us, He created us with the capacity to love Him in return. That's how we were created originally. And then... Genesis 2, verse 7, it goes on to describe God's creation of the first person. Then God, the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. You know, if somebody is in an accident or is ill or something happens and they're not breathing, we call 911, we try to do what we can, they get there, they do the CPR and resuscitation, all that kind of stuff to make them come back. Well, God did the first CPR, didn't he? When he created the first man, when he breathed into his nostrils. Can you imagine how, how much more intimate can you get than that? The God of the universe, the creator of all that exists, breathes into your mouth and your nostrils the breath of life. That's a demonstration of his love for you his intimacy with you, his desire to be part of everything in your life and to give you so many blessings. And then I like how it's described in Acts chapter 3, verses 14 to 15, Jesus is the author of life. But I have to build you the context here. What's going on in this chapter is this is right after the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people were brought to to the Lord. They were brought... As Peter stood up and preached, they were brought to faith in Jesus as their Savior. They were all baptized, 3,000 people in one day. And then the next day or several days later, Peter and John are going up to the temple at the time of prayer. And as they're going close to the gate, there's a man seated, seated there. And he's seated there for the reason of getting gifts, right? What more uh, lucrative spot to sit if you're a person in that condition crippled from birth, then where all these compassionate people are walking by, 
right? They're on their way to the temple to pray. And so Peter and John are walking by. The guy goes, hey, can you help me out? Peter looks at him and he said, I don't have silver and I don't have gold, but what I have I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And instantly, he was healed. The guy who'd never walked was now walking. And not just walking, he was walking and leaping and praising God, following them everywhere they went throughout the temple. And everybody was gathering around. Isn't that the guy? Isn't that the guy that was sitting by the gate? I I don't know. He kind of looks like him, but I don't know. I don't think so. And I'm sure the guy's like, it's me. (laughs) It's me. I'm the guy. And the crowd gathers because they wonder, what happened? How how did this guy get healed? So they all come together, and Peter preaches again. And he said, he told the whole story. It's not not by us. We didn't do anything. It's God. It's in the name of Jesus that this man now stands before you healed. And they go on to tell the whole story of what happened to Jesus, how he lived this wonderful life. He taught the disciples, and he came as the Messiah. And then, then, then this passage comes. But you denied the holy and righteous one. You denied him and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. We know the name, right? Barabbas. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. Can you see anything more ironic? You killed the author of life. Jesus, our Savior, is the author of life. He's the author of, he was part of creation, making everything come into existence. He was the firstborn from the dead, and he gives eternal life to everyone who believes in him. He's the author of life. Just love that description of Jesus. So these things have an impact on who we are and what we do and what we say. That God is the creator of every living thing and he's the creator of us. And that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is the author of life. Not just life out there, but life in here. He's the author of my life. And then we move on to the next point, and that is, Jesus bought us. You've heard that expression. This is where it comes from. Well, it's in the book of Revelation too, right? But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20, Paul is writing to this very immoral church, people that are living in gross sexual sin, and all these awful things are going on, and Paul is trying to straighten them out. As the one who started the church, Paul was the great missionary, he started the church in Corinth. He's trying to straighten them out and get them back on track. And so he's talking, calling them to account, stop living immorally. He says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Can you think of anything more countercultural than you are not your own? Our culture encourages us to think we are the center of the universe and everything revolves around us. And whatever we want, it's okay. Whatever I say about myself, whatever I identify as myself, that's okay because I am the king. But that's not what God says. You are not your own. You're not. You belong to him. So what you do with this body needs to please him. Needs to give glory to him. Needs to praise him. Luther's small catechism has this beautiful description of what this is all about. Just ties it all together in such a wonderful way in the explanation of the second article of the Apostles' Creed. And I'll break it down for you for a second. The first article is all about God the Father, Creator, right? Second article, all about Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior. Third article, all about the Holy Spirit, 
how He fills us and equips us and enables us to believe and strengthens us in our faith and all of those things. Today we're talking about the second article, all about Jesus. And I want you to say these words with me. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. Wow. Luther was simply saying what he believed with all his heart, that we have been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. It's really tough for me, and I don't know about you, but it's really tough for me to keep focused on the, the price that was paid when Jesus bought us. When I was a young person, I did not like Lent, the season of Lent. It was so down. I mean, the, the hymns are all in a minor key, and, and the, they're kind of like dirge or something like that, and everything was low key and down, and and then we had Good Friday, and they call it Good Friday, but it wasn't good. <laughs> it was bad. It's when they did that horrible stuff to Jesus and nailed him to the cross. And as a young person, I just didn't like it. I didn't want to hear about those awful things. But as I grew and matured in my faith, I understood it's so crucial for us to go there, to understand the price that was paid, to read the story of how he was beaten and abused and the nails driven right through his hands and right through his legs into the wood and how he hung there exposed to the public. Humiliating, disgraceful, and how he did it for me. It's so important for us to know the price, right? Right? It's so important for us to know at what cost we've been purchased. First of all, it tells us our value, right? Every one of you, all of us, are so precious in God's sight that He was willing to send His Son to pay that price. That's your identity, that's your value. It's not what that devil is whispering in your ear, all these strange things and awful things, or all these negative self-esteem kind of issues. That's all from the devil, and you know he's really good at lying. But the truth is that you're so wonderful in God's sight. He created you in His image, and He loves you so much that He willingly sent His Son to pay that price for you to be forgiven and live forever in heaven. So, as we look at Luther's explanation, what is the implication? We've been purchased by God. For what purpose? That I may be His own and live under Him in His kingdom and serve Him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness that I may be His own. Live under Him. What does that mean? Does anybody know? It means that we surrender to God. We acknowledge who God is and that His Word has authority in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. His Word reigns supreme. When we think about what we might do with our lives, we think, God, what do you want me to do? You've given me this talent, this interest, this skill, this opportunity, 
you've opened these doors for me. You've given me a good education. You've given me parents that are behind me. What do you want me to do with all this? It's so crucial that we include God in that decision about our future. He has much to say. Beautiful, wonderful plans for you. He just needs to be consulted. What does he say about this, though? We have, we have these lives given from him, and they're, they're precious. And so he makes a command. You shall not murder. You shall not harm anyone else's life. You shall not take another life. And you might be able to think, well, you know, I'm not in the service, not in the military. I'm not in law enforcement. I'm not um, a criminal with doing bad things. I'm very likely to spend my whole life and never take someone else's life. So what does this have to say to me? You shall not murder. What does it mean? Well, Jesus breaks it down to us in Matthew 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount. That's where Jesus is teaching. You know, you can easily dodge some of those commandments and say, oh, I'm not doing that one. I'm not doing that one. But the way Jesus explains it, we're all breaking them, right? Matthew 5, 21 to 22 says, You have heard that it was said in those, to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Ever been angry at your brother or your sister? I have five brothers and two sisters. And I've been angry at them and they've been angry at me. And that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about a deep-seated anger that refuses to forgive, that just is not just anger, but hate. That's what Jesus is talking about. It's not okay to hate. Listen how he escalates it. So, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. That's a little bit more. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. That's pretty serious. Jesus is making a point here, isn't he? It's not okay to hate. It's not okay to carry around the anger. You know, we see so many people lashing out on social media and even just road rage and all this other stuff going on. It's not okay. Understandable, maybe, but not okay. We need to be different as God's people. He calls us to be different. 1 John chapter 3, verse 15. It's not up on the screen, but it's one more verse for you. 1 John chapter 3, verse 15 says, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. This verse was seared into my heart when I was a young pastor right out of seminary in the inner city of Houston. In that southern town, racism was very open. And I grew up in the north, and I just... I wasn't going to let it happen. I wasn't going to listen to it. I wasn't going to permit it. So I preached on this message like a hammer, like the hammer of God, to teach people it's not okay to hate just based on what a person looks like or where they're from or what their politics are. It's not okay. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So, even if you say you're a Christian, a member of a church, maybe had an amazing experience, if you've got hate in your heart towards your brother, you're not going to heaven. You're not. That's something we have to reconcile. Pastor Joe would say, fix it up. I love that expression. Fix it up. If some, you've got a problem with somebody, go fix it up you hurt somebody's feelings, fix it up. Somebody hurt your feelings, fix it up. I mean, those words make it sound like it's really easy to do. (laughs) 
I know it's not. But it's not okay to stay in a bad place. God calls us to be peacemakers and reconcilers and bridge builders and all of those things. And that's the implications of what we're talking about today. We were created by God in His image. We were purchased by God with that awful price. Those two things should have an impact on who we are, what we say, and what we do. When we're seeking a plan for our future, God needs to be guiding that. That's what the implication is. When we're seeking to define ourselves and establish our identity, God needs to speak into that, and He does. We are called to obedience. We are called to make peace. We are called to be life givers and difference makers. This is how it works out for me. I'm having, because I'm not a big confrontation person. I'm a look the other way, go the other way, and hope it gets better. <laughs> I'm just, it's, I mean, I'm getting better at it, but it's hard for me to confront bad stuff. But God has used me to confront situations, and He'll use you to do the same because it's the way He is. He confronted the difficulty of our sin, and He fixed it up, didn't He? He raised Jesus from the dead. And as we think about Jesus... He laid down His life for us. And isn't that what God calls us to do too? I think about marriage because this is, it's kind of like the microcosm of life. If we're doing good in marriage, our our marriage is successful and everything, a lot of other things will fall in place too. If we're right with God, a lot of other things will fall in place too. And those two kind of intersect because God gave us a spouse to teach us about His love for us. And He calls us to love our spouse the way He loves our spouse. Not based on performance or anything external or superficial, but based on His love for our spouse. That's the model. That's the standard. That's the bar. So God calls us to love our neighbors. God calls us to value the lives of others. God calls us to protect the lives of others because He created them too. All this we are called to do in Jesus' name. Amen?